Welcome to the Guild Family Stream. Brethren in Christ, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This is Timothy Flanders on the Guild Family Stream. Thank you to all of our Guild members for supporting this apostolate. And today we're going to talk about the Divine Mercy controversy. Obviously, the Divine Mercy Sunday was uh, low Sunday was last uh, Sunday. And the controversy just continues. And we had a little discussion in our guild chat. And so we're going to review all of your comments and uh, all of the sources that I was able to come up with uh, the past four hours or so, looking at everything we can here. This is still preliminary. There's still more things to uncover. But uh, we'll look at the preliminary resources that we've come up with so far. And just a reminder, I sent all the guild members are guild only master lists currently has 136 videos of content for guild members only. So you can get and have access to that. Uh, as always, we're going to release the first 15 minutes of this video to the public and uh, to support the uh, guild. So if you want the full video, the full conversation, you have to become a guild member at meaning of slash register. So, uh, and once again, this is always a conversation. So chat in whenever you like, share your comments, your questions, your objections, your thoughts, and we will go through it. So the divine mercy controversy. So here's here's the agenda. We'll talk about uh, just full disclosure. What's my experience with this devotion? So where am I coming from with this? We'll talk about the magisterial concerns. What is our level of, of assent? What did the local bishop say? What did the various popes say? Um, one of the major objections is that, that this is presumption. This is uh, promising a boundless, unconditional mercy. Is this offering medicine of mercy to the Antichrist? And then we'll talk about Fatim, Faustina's vision of hell and the conditions for mercy that she gives in her diary. We'll be looking through the, the diary of Faustina here. I was... Uh, one of the things that makes this preliminary here, here's the diary. We'll, we'll be reading through some of the passages. Um, some of the, some of the passages will not be controversial. Some of them will, will be controversial. We'll talk about them. Um, and one of the things, uh, one of the sources that I looked at was Tony Shriver. He is a, uh, a big trad apostle of divine mercy. And if you're not familiar with Tony Shriver, I encourage you go to, um, Oh, you know, I didn't have, I didn't have this. Let's see. Divine mercy and divine mercy and you, that is his book. And he is a researcher, um, Tony Schreiner. He's a researcher and author of this book, uh, divine mercy and you. So I talked to him as well as texting with him a little bit. Um, what we need for the, for the next level of this research is we need some solid secondary sources. Uh, we've got this primary source, the diary, uh, there's a, a lot of secondary articles, secondary source articles out there, which we'll reference in this discussion. But um, Schreiner is sending me his book so we can talk more with him as well directly as he's done extensive research on the topic and he is coming from a trad perspective. So uh, then we'll talk about uh, one of our guild members brought up a comparison with another pre-Vatican II approved devotion, which uses the rosary. That's very interesting. We'll talk about the original image of Divine Mercy versus the popular image. Uh, we'll talk about Polish language difficulties. We'll have all your comments. And then the most important part, I think, is looking at the diary, uh, quotations from the diary that seem to promote a problematic spirituality. So all that and more coming up. Just first, uh, shout out to everyone who's in the guild chat right now. What, what's up? Steven is here. What's up, Steven? Steven took a break from from for Lent from... Uh, all a bunch of technology. Good for him. Hope it was fruitful for you. Uh, Richard says, thank you for the master list. Yeah. So every, every guild stream from now on will be on the master list. So if you ever want to go back and get all of the guild streams that they are, we have, um, it's <laughs> the only, uh, the only thing is that I have, there's two videos that are not on the guild master list because they're, they're too controversial, even for, for you unlisted YouTube. So they are in the, the main, big series that's controversial in the master list you know what which one i'm talking about and there's two additional videos on that list which i can't even put on unlisted video so 
uh it's it's they're just so controversial so anyhow let's let's uh continue the discussion so here's the sources that i consulted as a part of this presentation as i said all of these sources are um secondary sources um in, of articles okay so what i need to go to the next level are secondary sources uh written sources scholarly sources uh obviously we we looked at both pro and against as well as other uh, Kennedy All and Boca did a uh, a nice treatment discussing two of the articles. Um, I also looked at Polish Wikipedia, all the sources, and I found some interesting tidbits in there too. I didn't hadn't seen any other sources. Um, I think that on the at the outset we need to concede. I think that the devotees of the 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 Divine Mercy should concede to the critics that the trad critique is true enough in practice, uh, and the trad critique is essentially that. This is promoting an, promoting an unconditional mercy. This is promoting the sin of presumption, which is when you presume on God's mercy to be accepted into eternal life or into forgiveness without penance. And I think that's true enough in practice. And I'm sure that there's devotees out there of divine mercy who excessively promote it. So I think that should be conceded that the trad critique is legitimate and valid in practice. So that sh that should be obvious to to any pious catholic out there yet it should also be conceded on the other side that the theological critique is a minority view among trads uh in that source list there are some substantial trad voices who are quite uh defensive of the divine mercy devotion um kennedy hall points out how the sspx prayer book does publish the chaplet um i've heard from sources that various sspx priests promote it so if you trust the sspx um that is one aspect but there's also division even among the sspx so here's my experience with the devotion um i am not really I, i'm not very devoted to divine mercy i i've prayed the chaplet from time to time um it, at my old polish parish i i used to attend a unicorn novus ordo parish that was a polish parish and they had a very strong devotion to uh, the divine mercy. And for a few years when I was at that parish, we did pray the novena and the novena always struck me as quite traditional because it is a, it is a novena for the conversion of sinners. And it has these various quotations from the diary describing wounds inflicted on the heart of Jesus by non-Catholics. So for example, uh, quoting diary page 274 says this quote today on the fifth day of the novena, Bring to me the souls of heretics and schismatics and immerse them in the ocean of my mercy. During my bitter passion, they tore at my body and heart. End quote. So this is Jesus in the in the, the um, locution to St. Faustina saying that heretics and schismatics tore at his heart. So uh, and so then we're praying for their conversion. So that the, the novena prays for all these different groups of people during these nine days. And some of them are the faithful and offering mercy for them who are more or less faithful, but it's also praying for sinners like heretics and schismatics. There's also a day for the lukewarm, the lukewarm Catholics. Um, Jesus says that the lukewarm Catholics are the ones that hurt him the most. Um, so um, that's just always struck me. I mean, that's, that's pretty solid traditional spirituality there, obviously. Uh, it's very in line with Fatima, of course, offering reparation for sinners, praying for their conversion. Um, I've also used the chaplet uh, from time to time, according to the direction of Father Reginald Gary Goulagrange. I have RGL here. Um, now, he doesn't recommend the chaplet. What I mean is that he has a, a spiritual recommendation in his book, Three Ages of the Spiritual Life, where he talks about you can use a sanction. And a sanction is when you're trying to fight against your predominant fault. And so this your predominant fault is the thing that you, you fall into all the time that's like your main sin that's tied to your temperament which the devil uses to overcome you and a sanction is essentially this little punishment that you inflict on yourself this penance that you inflict on yourself every time you commit that particular sin so let's say you have the sin of anger or something like you have trouble um you know holding your tongue when you get angry so on Tuesday, you sinned with your tongue. You got angry at your coworker or whatever, or you were sarcastic or whatever. Okay, so then you pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and the chaplet takes about five minutes to pray. So it's a lot shorter, so it's not like you have to throw down a whole five-decade rosary. 
uh, one third of the rosary every time you make this sin because you might you might sin twice in that matter a day. You know, then you got two chaplets to to pray. So, anyways, this is this is one one of my experiences with the chaplet. I've used it for um, for this 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 method that uh, RGL has used in terms of um, the sanction. So, it, one of the things I want to emphasize too is that none of the sources that I looked at that were against the divine mercy, none of these. None of them claimed that the prayers of the chaplet themselves are problematic in and of themselves. And we'll talk about another uh, comparison with another pre-Vatican II devotion, which is um, very similar. So we'll talk about that, which also uses the rosary. <clears throat> but so that's that's my experience with it, although I'm, I'm not really a devoted, you know, I, I, I don't really do it very often. Um, I haven't really prayed the novena in a while. Uh, frankly, it's always for me coming from the Eastern Orthodox perspective, it's always struck me as rather incongruous for me personally to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, which is meditating on the blood of Christ and the passion during Easter week, because the novena starts on Good Friday and goes to low Sunday. So you're actually praying this novena during the resurrection liturgy. So it, it's it always has seemed incongruous to me, but that that probably just it could be much as my own uh, hard hardness to lack uh, not understand it but that's just my experience just just for uh, full disclosure as to where i'm coming from here i don't really have a particular um position that's strongly on this this is all just preliminary research as i said so here's some of the interesting things that i i found here is that uh a total of four different local bishops i saw promoted and approved the devotion since the very beginning of the alleged and approved apparitions and locutions to St. Faustina in the early 30s, all the way to her death in 1938. Uh, so Gorzov, Jelbrzovsky, Sapieha, the, the primate of uh, Krakow and Lone, as well as the abbess Marachevska. And they began the canonization process of St. Faustina in 1947. And this was then uh, continued with the local bishop in 1965. In 1967, Karol Wojtyla, later John Paul II, he was appointed by Ottaviani to be the local uh, organizer of this cause. Um, so there's the, uh, you know, this is when we compare this, um, apparitions are always uh, given to the local bishop to approve or disprove, to investigate, because the church understands that the local bishop, he knows the language. He knows the customs. He knows the people. He's the best one to investigate an apparition. Um, so there's a there's a lot of local approval. I think that's one of the first, you know, scores in in the, the favor of the divine mercy. There's her, she was uh, evaluated by her confessor. Her confessor actually had her had a mental, uh, psychological evaluation, which she passed in the very beginning. Uh, so she there seems to be no evidence in according to any of the sources I looked at, there's no evidence that she manifested any of the problematic things like at Medjugorje. For example, Medjugorje, the seers are lying to the local bishop. They were caught in lies. They've admitted it. They've been disobedient to the local bishop. All these sort of warning signs about bad apparitions and bad things, enthusiastic cults, as uh, Bannister would say. Uh, there's none of, those, none of those red flags at this point. What's interesting is that in 1938, there is she has a prediction of the war coming. And this is it coincides with Fatima because Fatima predicted that there would be a sign from heaven that the penance was uh, was uh, not done. There was a sign from heaven, which that sign happened in January of 1938. There was a geomagnetic storm, which was like the um, northern lights that happened that everyone saw in Europe. It was a sign from heaven. And shortly thereafter, the uh, Nazi invasion of Austria happened. So that was in May 13 of 38. But the invasion of Poland had not yet happened because that would happen the, the, the year after. And Faustina dies on October 5, 1938. What's interesting is that the death deaths of the popes, uh, Pope Pius X and Pope Pius XI, both coincide with this sort of eve of first world war and the second world war. So I think it's interesting that there is this, co this, this 
providential coincidence here. Um, and uh, this is what causes uh, Bishop Zelbivskovsky to further promote the devotion after the Nazi invasion because he sees that Faustina predicted the war or predicted the invasion itself. Um, now, what's interesting is that there's a curious thing about uh, under Pius XII and John the Twenty Third. Now, some sources indicated that uh, her devotions were prohibited and placed on the index uh, under Pius the Twelfth. Some say under John the Twenty Third. However, they also admit that Pius the Twelfth blessed an image of the Divine Mercy. Um, now, my question would be to look into these further secondary sources, which I haven't gotten into yet. Is this due to their canonization proceedings? There were, like I said, there was a canonization proceedings going on since 1947. Were they simply, were they seeing problems and then prohibiting further devotion before the canonization proceeding was done? Because what's interesting, as I said, right after this happens, 1958, early 60s, the local bishop is still a point. They don't actually halt the canonization proceedings. Uh, so this kind of, this so-called condemnation, which is really a suppression or a prohibit prohibition is taken for the public so the public is warned we're not going to promote this from rome but then they continue the local bishop to continue the whole process so it, it that's it, it, it without further research we can't really conclude right now for sure without looking at further sources here but um it seems at least that they they saw enough problematic things with what they had in the early pontificate of john the 23rd that they wanted to prohibit further devotion while continuing the whole investigation. So it, it does seem reasonable to conclude that this initial prohibition was preliminary and uh, meant to be um, just a preliminary caution at this point because the proceedings were still going up. But that, that's what it, it looks like to me at this point. Like I said, this is still preliminary. Now, um, magisterial reversal. Now, the important thing to remember here is... Um, uh, we need to have a pious submission to the magisterium, to the local bishop regarding apparitions uh, and all this sort of thing. But these these uh, apparitions, apparitions themselves, private revelations are of a secondary weight in terms of revelation, secondary to the public revelation, of course. And um, there is obviously a reversal from the initial prohibition to the current promotion, I, I don't think it's entirely unreasonable to to assert that the current promotion then it must be an error. I don't think it's totally unreasonable because it's obviously a reversal. So if the magisterium reversed itself here, or the local the um, the local judgment reversed itself here, I don't think it's totally unreasonable here. Um, so once again, I would emphasize that. There's a legitimate critique here, uh, at least in practice, for sure. So we need to, uh, you know, be fair and take our fellow Catholics seriously and and not, you know, label each other because you're this, you're that. Let's just take it, uh, take it all in. So uh, last part that I want to emphasize before we go into our, um, this is the last public portion that we'll talk about is the, the medicine of mercy. So obviously, um, the the critique in practice, which I think is legitimate, is this unconditional mercy and the emasculated spirituality of the medicine of mercy post-war. Now, I think there's two sides of this coin. On the one hand, we do have the emasculated uh, mercy for everyone, mercy for the Antichrist, mercy for the demons, mercy for the non-Catholics etc cetera, etc cetera, without repentance we do have that problem uh which is that's legitimate critique but at the same time there's also this post-war post-modern exhaustion and that has to do with the despair that people feel after the war in particular this is uh conspicuously manifested with elber Camus in the myth of Sisyphus after the war, where he says, there is no meaning in life. Should you just kill yourself? And this is the post-war exhaustion. 
it's it's easy for us to look back at the 60s, the 50s and 60s or 70s and think that our, our forefathers were crazy hippies. Um, and we need to be uh, careful with that because we did not have to deal with a worldwide bloodbath and the consequences of that. And the what it did to the psyche of just people. I mean, this type of exhaustion and despair. So, on the other hand, of the the medicine mercy, we need to. I think there's a there is a sympathetic look at that. Where we can say, well, there is an aspect to that too for some souls. Some souls are struggling with presumption, the sin of presumption, but other souls are struggling with the sin of despair. So. There, there's this this justice and mercy. We need to have for the souls who are struggling with presumption. We need to emphasize justice. You do need to repent for your sin. You can't presume on God's mercy. But on the other hand, there is also a post-war milieu of exhaustion and despair in this post-modernism. So there's the the, the sort of the ideology of modernism in the sense of we have full confidence in our. Um, in our institutions, in our industry, and then we have World War One, and then we have the, the what's called the Lost Generation, which is that first sort of wave of despair. Uh, you get this in The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, where there is this despair, this 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 loneliness, this darkness after World War One, and then it just gets worse after World War Two, and so there is this despair aspect. And so I think there is an aspect um, to uh, the need for the medicine of mercy for some souls. I think it very it very much is um, there is two sides to that coin. So that is the end of the public portion. Again, if you want to see the whole conversation, you have to go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register, become a guild member. And if you can't afford it, you can always contact us, meaningofcatholic.com slash contact.